Sure. My name is Ian McRae. I'm an extension entomologist with the Department of Entomology at the University of Minnesota. I'm officed at the Research and Outreach Center up in northwest Minnesota at Crookston. Um, I've been an entomologist for about 30 years now and I work mostly in, uh, well, I've done small grains and in, in Crookston I'm mostly in the Red River Valley working on potatoes, sugar beets, small grains, soybeans, um, oilseed crops. I'll be discussing the uh, growing concern um, in, uh, in Colorado potato beetle management using neonicotinoid insecticides. We've seen a growing tolerance of populations in central Minnesota and in the Red River Valley uh, to be uh, basically tolerate the, the insecticides, the neonicotinoid insecticides, and these are uh, things like imidacloprid and clothianidin and, and thiomethoxam. Um, and the other neonicotinoids as well. Uh, these have become a real staple in the management for Colorado potato beetle and as we lose efficacy of these products we're going to have a more difficult time managing this insect. We really have to start thinking about managing our insecticides and, and how we actually apply them and uh, what modes of action we use uh, and we have to start adopting um, uh, tactics that fall more into insecticide resistance management. Uh, we have a tendency to, when we find one that works, have a tendency to, to use that uh, um, almost exclusively and that's really not going to be an, uh, an operable strategy in the future. When we start to see tolerance build and different modes of action, we're, we're going to have to, to go to different modes of action of insecticides to find um, control. And a lot of these alternative modes are are fairly expensive. Um, Colorado potato beetle is a, we refer to it as the poster child of insecticide resistance. It's developed resistance to a number of different insecticides. In fact, I think at last count it was about 51 different insecticides that we've seen uh, resistance in, in, in Colorado potato beetle. So a lot of the insecticides that we've previously used in this area for this insect we already see have, we already have resistance in the area to those and so it's becoming more and more challenging to find something to actually control these populations so we have to husband what we have and we have to also husband the newer materials that are coming online that might be effective as well so they we don't lose them to resistance as well well it's it's really interesting actually it's a good biological story um, the reason that we we see resistance develop. It's it's a it's a genetic process. It's um, you're, what you're really doing when you continually expose them to one mode of action. In other words, an insecticide that works only in, in this one specific way is you kill all of the individuals that are susceptible to that that uh, um, mode of action. Usually, there is a an insect or or, or a um, let me rephrase that. There is a gene in the population. It's a rare, generally speaking, a rare allele. But it, it, it codes for a trait that allows the insect to detoxify that particular insecticide. And as you select against all the susceptible ones, the only ones that are left to reproduce are the ones that have this trait that make it resistant. And so what you end up with is a population of insects that will not respond to that insecticide. And so that's, that's part of the trial. The next thing is why would that gene be there? If you think about Colorado potato beetle and the, and the plants that it eats, there's a lot of uh, toxic chemistry that's actually in potato leaves. I mean, it's one of the reasons we don't consume potato leaf salads. Um, and the insect actually has to detoxify those to get nourishment from it. So we speculate that it's a pretty small step from, you know, detoxifying a potato leaf to detoxifying something else. Usually these toxic detoxification mechanisms are, are fairly broad in general and they're designed to, to cover a whole bunch of different environmental toxins and we refer to them as, as usually mixed function oxidases and esterases and things like that and we, we speculate that's what's happening. Uh, yes, there are things you can do. Uh, the husbanding of the materials, in other words, if you use a, a neonicotinoid as a seed treatment, which is a, a fairly popular application in, uh, in uh, seed production, um, don't follow it with a foliar application of another neonicotinoid. In other words, change your modes of action, rotate them, and what you will do is you'll kind of husband that material through and keep it around as a tool in the toolbox for a longer period of time. Um, what the 2014 uh, um, viewpoint is going to be, well, we're certainly going to do a lot of trials throughout the Red River Valley, throughout central Minnesota and through North Dakota and start looking. I know that, that they're going to be testing it for in Man testing for it in Manitoba as well. They already did last year. Um, I don't know if you'll see a, a large increase, but if you do not start to do these resistance management tactics, then yes, we will see a, a geographic spread in, in the, you know, the 
populations that, ha that are tolerant to these insecticides, and we'll lose them. Um, you know, uh, sanitation is all is is important when managing Colorado potato beetle. Um, there's a number of other uh, um, things we can do. Um, most of them are um, a lot more expensive than the than the chemical management, which is one of the reasons why chemical management is so important in the in the management of this particular insect. Um, there really aren't that many, uh, although there are being developed. There really aren't currently that many resistant potato varieties to Colorado potato beetle, although they are being developed. And so as, uh, you know, as the future rolls along, I'm sure we're going to see an awful lot of different alternatives that pop up.